Hi. Hi, and welcome to this Cosmere Festival 2021 event, brought to you in partnership with Kirklees Libraries. You can find details on the rest of the programme by visiting our website, which is cosmerefestival.co.uk, or by finding us on social media where we're Cosmere Festival basically everywhere. If you want to support the festival further, we have our Ko-Fi link, which helps fund future editions like 2022, where we should have a full programme and be back in person, fingers crossed. But for now, stay safe, enjoy the show, and we'll see you very soon. So, thank you very much to Dave. Dave's the director of the festival. Um, so, hello and welcome to today's session of 2021's Cosmia Festival. I'm Linda and I'm one of the librarians who's lucky enough to look after all the libraries in Kirklees. If you missed any of the Cosmia sessions, uh, which started last Saturday, you can catch up with them at the Cosmia Festival website, which is cosmiafestival.co.uk 2021. There you go, and that will tell you everything that's gone before. This is the eighth session that we're having, so and there were some fantastic things that have gone before, both with children's books, with um, adult books, and with now with YA, which is today's session. Now, our lovely friends at Read Bookshops in Home Firth are offering a 20% discount on all of the books featured in the Cosmia Festival, and I'll tell you all about this at the end of the broadcast. So keep watching and then you'll find out how to get your discount on all of the books. Um, today, I'm talking to Emily Barr. Now, Emily started out working as a journalist in London, but she always hankered after a quiet room and a book to write. She was commissioned to go travelling for a year and came back with the beginnings of a novel set in the world of backpackers in Asia. And this became Backpack, which was her adult book, which was published in 2001. It was a thriller and it won the WH Smith's New Talent Award. Emily has since gone on to write 13 more adult novels, one novella and four books for young adults. And these have been published um, in the UK and also around the world. Emily lives in the beautiful county of Cornwall, which is where she is today, where she's coming to meet us from today. If you have any questions for Emily, if you could just pop them in the chat box, I'll be able to ask them as we go along. But I'm so excited to be able to bring Emily into the studio. Um, and we're going to do that now. Hi, Emily. Hello, Linda. Thank you so much for inviting me today. It's it's lovely to be here. It really is. Thank you. I get, I get so excited. And honestly, I feel as though I'm in the presence of literary royalty. When <laughs> When you could have, the, the, your, when I looked at your um, your your work um, since two thousand and one, it's absolutely astonishing um, the, the the amount of books that you've the num sorry the number of books that you've written and the amount of subjects that you've covered. Um, I read somewhere that you said blocking out the world and making things up is my very favourite thing, and you have such an amazing imagination, which has taken your readers into so many different worlds, so many different genres. And so I wondered if it would be possible to start with, I know it's a huge question, uh, just giving our audience a flavour of all the work that you've been doing in that time. <laughs> oh, yes. Um, yes. Yeah, so as you said, I began in 2001 with the publication of Back pack my first book which was also the year I had my first child so those 2001 was a big a big year for me mm. um, backpack was a travel thriller I then went on to write um, 12 of 12 loosely termed travel related thrillers for um, my publisher headline the last of them was called the sleeper and it was a a kind of murder mystery set on there's a sleeper train between London Paddington and Penzance in Cornwall and I was using it quite a lot to travel to and from London if I had to go up for meetings and things from down here in Cornwall and I loved it absolutely love traveling by train I love traveling anyway and when I realized that I could live here get on a train at about 10 10 30 at night wake up in the morning asleep at Paddington with the station kind of going on around you I, I thought it was it was such a kind of evocative thing and such a magical experience when the trains worked, which they don't always, it can go terribly wrong. <laughs> and then I heard anecdotally about some, a lot of people were using it to travel up on a Sunday night, work in London during the week, travel back down to their families at the weekend. And I heard an, a story about two people doing that 
having an affair on the train and I just had one of those moments of like that's my next book so the sleeper was I suppose my last or not last ever but my most recent adult travel thriller it then went off into Asia and was um was quite quite travelly in the end um and then from then I moved into writing for young adults which is something I love to do I started I don't think it's coincidence I started writing YA when my children became kind of that that sort of age group mm -hmm. my first child was a teenager and I but I did it because I had an idea for a book publishing can be very set in what genre you work in so I was a travel thriller writer and then the book that was in my head wasn't re didn't really fit into what I was doing before I just had a, a so I suppose an image of a young woman in somewhere with snow and the midnight sun not quite knowing why she's there and it just came from the, uh, that image to start with it was really strange it wasn't something that had happened to me before but I started writing this book it wasn't the book I was meant to be writing I was supposed to be writing another travel thriller the sleeper had sold well and I was supposed to be doing basically more of the same and I just for the first time ever I didn't want to do more of the same I, I so I was half-heartedly thinking I'll write another travel thriller that one was set on a train maybe I could do one set on a boat and then I I was kind of doing it by numbers which had never happened to me before my heart wasn't really in it my heart was in this book set in the arctic so I was trying to, to juggle both of them I tried to make the arctic book into the book I was meant to be writing it didn't really work and then I realized that this art book was actually a young adult book, which I'd never written before. I had read, I was really interested in it as a genre. And I found that I was writing YA without having set out to do it at all. So I, that was kind of the beginning of my move into YA. I, as soon as I started thinking of this Arctic book I was writing as YA, it just sort of exploded onto the page. It was, um, it was about a girl called Flora who lives here in Cornwall and, has um, anterograde amnesia, which means that she has a lot of problems with short-term memory and she doesn't know where she is or why she's there quite often. I did a lot of research into, into that condition because I wanted to get it right. And I went to the Arctic and, and wrote this book, but all the time I was doing it without a publisher. So I was doing it just hoping that it would turn out all right in the end I was doing lots and lots of freelance work as well to try and make enough money to live off so it did feel very rash to step away from a publisher I had a long-lasting relationship with but I just really wanted to write this YA book so I did and then to cut a very long story short um, Penguin ended up publishing it and I've now written Things to Do Before the End of the World is my fourth YA book with Penguin I have written the fifth one, which I've got actually right next to me for um because I'm proofreading it right now, it's called Ghosted, and that is the first time I've actually told anybody that. Um and um I've I'm ongoingly writing YA for Penguin, which is wonderful. I absolutely love it. And I also had a book that came to me that I started writing on the side a few years ago just for fun, which was a sci-fi book about a pandemic this was before covid and mm -hmm. a little boy who who was ill in the pandemic got better and had a voice in his head which his family um initially think is an imaginary friend but it turns out it might be something a little bit more sinister um that is published with a an american publisher with berkeley who are a branch of penguin new york and it's called we hear voices so that's i'm now writing my second um sci-fi horror book for that publisher so i do feel i'm kind of spreading spreading myself all over all the genres just by writing what i want to write at the time it it can make for some upheavals career-wise but it keeps it all interesting sorry that, that was a very very long <laughs> answer to to your question sorry I, I know it was a difficult question because I wanted you to put all that body of work into into one question. But when I when I started, um, you know, with, your books have been in libraries, uh, so I've always come across them because you work I'm a librarian. So I've always seen Emily Barr's name on the on the shelves, but along with millions of other authors. And so it isn't until you actually start yes the author themselves that you find out a little bit more about them. Um, and I was just so impressed that you could write horror you could write sci-fi you can write feelings you can write relationships you can write you just write um such a breadth of things that's what I was bowled over with so oh, that's thank why you, I, Linda. Wanted, I wanted to introduce the audience to, to that 
amazing talent that you've got. So oh. it pushes out and buys, you know, buys your book. Um, Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. That's very nice of you. Uh, which is there a particular genre that you enjoy writing most? Have you got a favourite? It's whatever I'm writing at the time, actually. I, I probably YA. I really I love writing YA. I think I can remember so clearly what it was like being a teenager and I think there's something really magical about that stage when when you're a child you're kind of not in control of your life you have or should have people looking after you you're you know you go to school when it's time to go to school you do you go on holiday when your parents take you on holiday you do all the things um your life is is kind of managed for you and then when you're an adult you have to make all those decisions you have to manage to pay your bills and and all of that stuff you have those responsibilities and it's the bit of going from one state to the other of going when you're not a child and you're not an adult i i find that so fascinating the the child turning into the person they're going to be for the rest of their life mm. i i love that i love exploring that that part of life i can remember it absolutely vividly myself um my children are now 15 17 and 20 so um I've I've kind of watched them go from from tiny little children and then suddenly you look at them again and and they're they're mm. adults it's it's something I love and I think with fiction there's so much to to look at and explore in that so many ideas that I think that YA will probably always be my my actual secret favorite so do you think you'll carry on writing YA or will you go back to your adult books you well I'd like to do both actually mm. I'm um I am writing YA at the moment. The book I'm currently working on is is my next YA book and as well as my next sci-fi book. I'm kind of juggling some deadlines at the moment and then proofreading the next YA book as well. But I would, uh, if at some point my schedule clears a little bit, I, I would also like to to go back to writing for adults as well. I think I've got, I've got an idea for a, a Cornwall-based mystery, kind of murder mystery story. So... I'll just keep doing everything they'll allow me to do, really. And will your so this is a kind of is this the one you were saying is a bit Agatha Christie, the one that you were talking about, the murder mystery? Yes, yes. Well, so my next, one? yeah, I've got a couple of murder mysteries on the go. My next, the YA book I'm currently finishing writing is a little bit Agatha Christie. It's a kind of ah. Agatha Christie with with teenagers in Cornwall, and then yes, beyond that, I've got a slightly less formed idea for for an adult thriller. Yeah. How on earth how on earth do you keep track of it all though when you've got all that going on in your mind? How do you focus? How do you focus and come up with these beautiful books? I, I struggle trying to remember trying to remember what I'm doing during the day, never mind juggling all that. How do you do it? You, oh, this was a lovely question that I heard somebody else ask. They said, Are you an architect or are you a gardener? When, when, you're, when you're writing your books, are you an architect? Do you plan or are you a gardener? Is it organic? Does it grow? Oh, that's a really nice way of putting it, isn't it? Mm. I am a bit of both. I I do plan and I really like to know the ending when I'm writing because I, I feel like if you know where you're writing towards, you save yourself a lot of, of stopping and deleting and a lot of despair when it all goes wrong, which it always does. It, I So I do like to know the end point but anything that goes from from my beginning point to my end point I, I don't really plan the steps along the way very much so I don't know what what's the the midpoint between an architect and a gardener <laughs> I don't know I just sort of build sheds and let things grow around them yeah yeah perhaps that's it perhaps you're, you're a shed builder and you yes. yeah well there you are you see you've got something else to describe yourself as, yes you? I have I like that thank you <laughs> so I was going to ask um about the move into into YA, but you did you did actually um, cover that when you were when you were talking uh, a bit earlier on. But what would you say were the differences in what in writing for adults and writing for YA? Is there a, it, it is it is the in writer? writing wise. I think I had a bit of a crash course when I was writing the the book that well, before I realised that the one memory of Flora Banks would be a YA book. I was trying to write it as an adult book and it wasn't really working. And then once I started thinking, this is YA, I had a, um, a wonderful agent. She she has since left agenting and I'm now with another wonderful agent at Curtis Brown. But, mm -hmm. but Lauren, who was my agent at that point, I hadn't worked with her before because she was a children's agent and mm -hmm. um, she kind of got, got brought in to help me make this book into, into YA. And she would 
she would send me notes saying things like can you make this more YA and I would look at it and go I don't know I don't know how to do it and then I began to see what she meant which was kind of slow it down emotionally allow the emotion in much more I think with adult books there's there's a lot more cynicism I think you you're it's not exactly expected to be more more cynical but I think with YA you can really explore the emotions in mm. in a sort of first time way and so a love story is likely to be a first love story and it's it's so we can all remember how overwhelming that was it's oh, yeah. it, it's it's so much more not exactly pure it's the emotions are much closer to the surface and you can allow yourself more time to to really let your characters experience all those mm -hmm. all those things i love the interaction you have with ya readers um who can really be from 11 years old you know up to any age mm -hmm. at all people of all ages obviously read it but i think if you touch something emotionally that pe that resonates with people and they will write to you to tell you so it's it's really um magical in a way that that often if you write an adult book and, and you can get a lovely email saying I enjoy your book and it's absolutely lovely but if you get one from somebody who's maybe 17 mm -hmm. saying you know I this this really um speaks to me and, and mirrors what I've experienced it it's really there's something really special about that and I also love there's a um although it's been a while because of Covid I love doing events where you meet YA readers they're they're teenage readers are the, just the best people I really love meeting them and I love doing things where you meet them there's um, a festival in London every year Yalk where um, it's the young adult literary convention and people come from all over the place it's part of comic-con and it's just so exciting I love going to Yalk it's been a shame for the last obviously the last few years that it hasn't oh, happened mm -hmm. and I the last book event I did before um, Covid was in the Netherlands where I went I went over by train because I was trying not to fly anymore and there's been no opportunity to fly anyway lately. So I went by train to Amsterdam and did a thing at the branch of Waterstones in Amsterdam and then went up to Eindhoven for a thing called Yaltival, which is a, a big YA festival. There was me, Alice Broadway and Stephanie Garber, who's obviously a huge, huge YA author from California. Mm -hmm. so it was the three of us and they had it was in a theater they had the entire theater full of of dutch readers dutch teenage readers they'd come in costumes mainly as stephanie's characters and and they we were signing books for four or five hours the amount of enthusiasm for books and words for the for the entire day of that festival was absolutely amazing so i i really really love meeting meeting readers and i look forward to in-person events starting up again um, we're, as, as librarians, we're always looking for uh, YA books that, that the teenagers can um, can identify with and will enjoy reading because we find that the teenage market is a bit difficult to get into libraries. We do really well with the children when they're little and they come with mum. Um, yes. And they go to school and they come through school. But once, yes. they get, once they get to teenagers, they're either on social media or they're out doing other things or whatever. Um, yeah. And it, there is such a, a joy of reading for whatever age. So it's lovely to come across books like yours that we can wholeheartedly recommend to oh, you. thank you. Because you, they, they will get, get so much out of them as well as just the, you know, the joy of reading. Um, so you talked about your first book, which was The Memory of Flora Banks. That was a 2016, I think. That one I think so, to, yes. That one. Um, and then the next one was uh, Truth and Lies of Ella Black. Mm -hmm. Now, if we're talking about one particular book, which we are today, which is the things to do before the end of the world. I'm always um, happy to talk about other work that you've done so that people watching have got something else to go out and look for. So can you tell us just a little bit about how The Truth and Lies of Ella Black came about? Yes, that's um, that's a, a real travel thriller, I think. Um, I think it's it's a sort of love it or hate it book more than my other YA books are it's it's quite dark and it's about a I when I got the contract with Penguin for them to publish the one memory of Flora Banks which was fantastic they generally publishing works on two book contracts so that you're you're signed up for two books at the same time and mm -hmm. so this was my second book in in that contract and really they gave me free reign to do whatever I wanted it's it's set um in 
mainly set in Rio. And I just wanted to catch that sort of heady, thrillery Brazil, um, hot, hot days, scary things happening and just write a, a really um, propulsive thriller. It's the character is is quite dark. She has a, a, a sort of second side of herself, which she tries to keep um, keep tucked away. So she's called Ella, and then every now and then her dark side takes over, called Bella, and t- she sort oh, of wow. converses with that. And she's not always very nice. And some readers don't like that, and some readers do like it. So when I get emails from readers saying that that they like that book, I I think yeah, there's a, a, a fellow person with a bit a little bit of dark a dark side to them um I, I really enjoyed writing that one because it's I just really let it all go she's she's at school um in uh, in Kent and then one day her parents come and take her out of school and take her to Rio and they won't tell her why and then she has to unravel all kinds of things about about herself and ends up running away and kind of fending for herself in the favelas of Rio it was it was lots lots of fun to, I'm, to I'm, getting, I'm getting quite a theme of travel here. Um, mm-hmm. Sarah, I'm getting quite a, a theme of travel. Is that travel seems to be very important to you? Yes, I love I love travel and I love writing about travel as well. I love going to a new place and kind of looking looking at it with with a sort of writing sensibility. I'll take lots of photos, make lots of notes, and then mm. always, unless it's a place that I know really well or or have lived I will always have my character experiencing it as I did because I think you mm. can't write as somebody who who actually comes from that place when you've just visited it as a tourist mm. so I will generally have characters coming from a sort of background that I know or a place that I know and then visiting somewhere seeing being overwhelmed by the whole thing of the new place I, I love I mean I just absolutely love it I am not taking aeroplanes anymore so I'm going to places by by train and if there's anything better than a a rail trip I don't know what it is I absolutely love it I'm looking forward to getting out and about a bit more um because it has been once once we get back into the new normal whatever that's going to be Mm -hmm. um so yeah that that's um I think I think everybody's capable of the dark side I think everybody's got a, a little bit of menace in them and I think um I think it's exciting when you read about uh, when you read about someone who's got two sides to them. You, everything that I've read of yours, I thought, well, I can identify with that. I can see, <laughs> I can see that person. You know, I can see um, where all that devilment comes from. Um, <laughs> the next one then was 2019, which was mm-hmm. the girl who came in from the woods. Yes, yes. Um, I I really loved writing that one. It's about a girl called Artie who's grown up in a tiny tiny little community in a forest clearing in India in a a, what was set up as a utopian community with a few people backpackers really from all over the world Um, she's she's always lived there and it's a matriarchy and it is actually a little community cut off from the world that basically works so that's all she's ever known she was the first child of several children born there and then they get actually I hadn't really thought about this in in connection with COVID, but they a an illness hits them, and she is the one who has to go out into the outside world to to look for help, and she's totally unprepared for it. So she she has a little four year old boy with her, and the two of them have to go walk out of the woods into into the outside world, and um, which is somewhere not that far from Mumbai. So she ends up in in Mumbai and just being absolutely hit by by the heat and the the whole experience of the massive city when she has only ever lived in in a tiny little world that she could see the edges of so that was she and then she ends up coming over to Britain to live with her maternal grandparents and having to fit into a, a suburban British life when that's not at all what she knew and and then kind of working out various things about things that have happened that she hasn't been aware of before I'm trying to to give no spoilers no, but don't, it's um... no, don't give us any spoilers and I'm, I'm just thinking um again you know when you think when thinking about the travel you say that this one's set in in, uh, in Mumbai do you um mm. 
so so obviously you have to fly you have to go to these places for your research you i did go, go there yes yes yes. Wonderful places. <laughs> yes i have i have been very lucky to um to visit lots of lots and lots of wonderful places and i know that that kind of makes it easier for me to to tr try to try not to fly anymore because i have been to lots of amazing places and i know that um it's easy for me to say to say that but yes i did that was in 2018 i guess um january 2018 i went to india to to do the research for this book which was so i could call it a work trip and it obviously was was not didn't feel like a work trip it was it was lots and lots of fun i went to mumbai with craig my husband and then we got a train inland to a place i'd found which was as close as i could get to somewhere that was a sort of clearing in the in the forest sort of place though it and we stayed in a um, a little place that had tree houses and hammocks and oh, it was it, it was amazing yeah it it was it wasn't really work it was it was and that, that again is the beauty of your books because a lot of people can't travel I mean I didn't even I didn't go I was brought up on a farm I didn't go on an aeroplane till I was crumbs uh, coming up to 30 so mm -hmm. um so for for and it, it isn't something that all you know all teenagers can afford or all parents no. can afford the teenagers. So and it's something that comes through in your books. It is a you, you do feel all the senses. So you take us to those places and we can feel those we can feel the, the, the heat, we can smell the things that they smell, we can you know, which is which is the beauty of, of reading, of course, that you can go to all these different places in your mind. Oh, there is something about reading um and being transported to another place that I, I love it in books, just mm. reading things, something that's set somewhere that I'm probably never going to go and, and just having the experience of, of that place. I love that. I think that's wonderful. Um, now, things to do before the end of the world. Uh, mm -hmm. Should have been 2020, but of course the pandemic delayed it to May 2021. It did. Yep. So let's talk about, um, let's talk a little bit about the, 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 this one, we shall show everybody. Here we go. Um, I can never do this right. There, that's it. <laughs> it's because it's back. Everything sort of. Yeah, there we go. Um, things to do before the end of the world, um, which is a powerful coming of age story that reminds the reader of our impact on the environment, which could mean our ultimate distinction, distinction, extinction. Sorry. Um, so, how how did this one come about? Where what's the thinking behind this one? I wanted to I I wanted to write about environmental matters and climate change. I wanted to do it in a fictional way. So I started to because I think that the the generation who are now teenagers are, are coming growing up in quite a scary world and I think that climate change is is something that eventually we're going to have to properly tackle although it it keeps on and on not happening. So I really feel for the current generation of teenagers that when they when they are grown up they're going to have they are going to have to to get to grips with mm -hmm. what climate change is is doing to the world and so I started to think about what what if it was compressed what if it was happening sooner and what actually would we all do if there was an end date um, when when the pollution was so accelerated that we knew roughly when we wouldn't be able to breathe the air anymore so i i kind of made made up a scenario where the the melting of the permafrost released things into the atmosphere and eventually that would mean it, there was no stopping it and we wouldn't be able to breathe the air anymore and there was a, a date for when that would happen so I I kind of read up on on the science a bit but basically I made up the science and that luckily isn't going to happen um not within oh, that time right. scale <laughs> yeah not not within such a short time scale anyway <laughs> yeah um and then i i just became completely obsessed with the idea of like what would you do if if we knew that that life was going to human life was going to either end or be dramatically altered in less than a year what would you actually do and then looking at what we have done about climate change I thought maybe we wouldn't actually do very much. Like, what can you actually do? So although in mm. my book, they they do suddenly try and stop using fossil fuels and, and things like that. Basically, everybody carries on as normal for a bit because you don't know really, like, what else are you going to do? And then the last summer, because the end date is in September, the last summer is just everybody going mad. And some people just want to carry on with their normal life and work up to the end. Some people want to 
travel the world. Um, people just have that last summer to do whatever you would do if it was if it was your last summer. So that against that backdrop, um, I've got a character, Olivia Libby, who's she's very very shy, and that is something I wanted to write about as well because I was very shy when I was younger, and that, that feeling of just not being able to get the words out because you don't have the confidence to speak, not wanting to talk in class, um, being really nervous and then being seen as the quiet one all the time because mm -hmm. although you have lots going on in your head, you can't manage to get the words out. I really wanted to capture that. Um, and I think from messages that I have from readers, the, um, there are some readers out there who, who um, feel the same way and it's nice to be able to put a character experiencing the same the same things that I did as a um, as a child and teenager. So she's very shy and hasn't got any social confidence. And then suddenly there's this this end of the world thing, and she's got less than a year to to do what she's going to do. And is is she going to find a way to come come out of herself and and have the best possible eight months she can, or what you know what's she going to do? So she's got her own her own little journey within within the global thing. And that it, it it comes across like when I was reading the book, I too was very shy, very shy at school, mm -hmm. didn't really fit in, didn't read out loud, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and I felt for her. So it's it's lovely that you've got that empathy and that the reader feels that through your words, um, to, to yeah, come from your your emotion to go into words for the reader to identify with. I just think that's magical. Um, and that, I, I found the same thing. I found myself imagining that what the world would be like if we knew the exact date. And I pictured a society turning very hedonistic in my mind. I thought it would be very apocalyptic and then dystopian. Mm. But that isn't what the book's about. The book's about the, the journey that Olivia takes and how people faced with this, this sort of, a, well, overwhelming fact. It's how those people will deal with it. And I yes. found thinking, well, if that was really going to happen, what would you do? You can't mm. change what would you do. And so all the characters in the book that are um, either returning home to a different country or they're, they're going to, to, to investigate a different country, it's the sort of thing that you would do. You, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't waste time creating this hedonistic world. You would just go about quietly um, doing what you wanted. And I wondered if it reflected, does the book reflect your attitude if if, we were, if the end of the world was going to come, yes, I've been. I I thought about it a lot, and I think that ultimately, I I would I, I would be most worried about my children, and I would want to spend as much time as possible um, with them. In the book, Libby's mother goes through various different churches and sort of desperately trying to find meaning um, somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I suppose. I suppose in the hope of of there being some kind of afterlife as the only the only thing to to cling on to, I think. But I think, yeah, I think I would want to check my children, you know, make everything as all right for my children as I could, and then travel around on trains and see things and do things and and experience as much of the world as I possibly could um, while it was still available. I, I did feel, um, as, as a mother, I mean, I've got two grown-up boys, but I, mm. as a mum, I was thinking, yes, she, she's, she wants um, Libby to experience the world. She wants her to go out and see things. And yet I, I kind of thought that as a mum, I might not want my children to go away from me. I, I would want them mm. to stay, either do things together or I'd want to protect them. Um, yeah. So my heart was in my mouth a bit when she's, when she's encouraging us to, to go away. Um, I wondered now if I could just ask you to read a little bit from the book, please, because I always think it's really at this point to be able to um, to give our readers, a, well, our audience, a flavour of what the book is like. Yes. There we go. Oh, yeah, it's funny. It's on the other side, isn't it? It is, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what I thought I would do, there's a there is a prologue to the book, but it's a little bit, long to read all in one go and quite hard to to cut it up so what I'm going to do is read just a couple of pages from chapter one so mm -hmm. what has happened here is there's been the announcement that the, um, all the rumors were true and there is actually the the breathable air is going to run out in September and she Libby then has a kind of breakdown over Christmas where she just stays in her room and can't engage with anything at all and then this is just the a couple of pages from from after that 
so page 12. When I emerged in January, ready to go back to college and see what the remaining months might hold, I discovered that most people had found ways of dealing with what was happening. While I had been shut away, my mother had, in an unlikely turn of events, started going to church. It had started on Christmas Day. Now, after a few weeks, she had decided the C of E was too woolly in the face of oncoming catastrophe and was going to look further afield. My stepfather, Sean, declared the whole thing was a hoax and wouldn't happen. And if it's not a hoax, it's best to act as if it was and was carrying on as normal. Dad and Annika had also opted to ignore it because they had small children and their days were busy enough to allow them to shut out that kind of thing. Most people, it turned out, were just getting on with it while making extravagant plans for the summer. The coming summer was the last summer we would ever have. It was going to be filled with festivals and parties and trips and holidays and everyone doing the things they'd always wanted to do. It had been renamed The End Times by one magazine, which had stuck, and now it seemed that the whole planet was going to have a huge, desperate party. Not me, though, because I didn't go to parties. My tiny win turned out to be that I did find the courage to sign my name on the audition sheet for Romeo and Juliet on the first day back at college in January. If there were only a few months left, I felt I could at least try to use it for something. Even if that something was trivial to everyone else, it would be meaningful to me. The changing of the atmosphere had, when I wasn't looking, been named the creep, and the term had been adopted by everyone. Similarly, the day the news broke was university, universally called 1212. I pictured the creep day and night, that green cloud creeping across the planet over land and sea, poisoning everything and everyone in its path until it was the only thing there was. At college, they said we still had to sit our summer exams and carry on as if things were normal. We had to leave all thoughts of impending doom at the door. And the oddest thing was that we did. We just carried on and hoped for the best because you can't panic for too long before you run right out of energy and decide to do something normal instead to give your mind and soul a break. And that's um, a couple of pages. Right, so we'll mm. just come back into the two of us. Mm. Um, I just wrote down the word acting while you were reading that. <laughs> um, acting plays a big part in the, in the, in the book. Um, acting that Olivia does to feel normal. She mm -hmm. signs up uh, to, to, to take part in the play. And she finds that when she is acting, when she takes on a persona, then she can face the world, as it were. And yes. I, I, found, I found that so interesting because um, that's something that I can identify with. If you put that cloak on and become an actress or an actor, as we're all called now, as they're all called, um, then you can be anything you want to be. And that kind of gets gets round that nervous. So I it does. Way, I love the way you brought that in. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, it does. And I, I mean, I'm not much of an actor, but I do remember I loved doing drama and things at school because, like you say, it gives you, you can be somebody else and that somehow frees you up to be able to um, to speak and join in. And um, yes, you, you just put on that cloak of being somebody else. And I don't think it's too much of a spoiler to say that um, Libby is then is visited by a cousin she didn't know she had who's come over on a boat from America as to see Europe as part of her her end times things. Natasha, who is a huge influence on how she spends the the remaining, well, the months of the summer, I suppose. And and under Natasha's influence, she she does go out and learn how to to put on a persona and do things she would never ever have, have imagined doing in her in her normal home life. So she I think the acting I was trying to put the seed of the acting thing in what she does at the beginning to to kind of um grow into into a slightly different sort of acting that that she and Natasha do when they're when they're out and about in in Europe yeah and, and we're not going to say what they do or why but then again the acting comes back into it as, as the story progresses because we find that other people are acting as well exactly we do yeah. who do you trust <laughs> who would have known um <laughs> the book has so many um diversities of issues there's mental health, there's LGBTQ, uh, the step families and the relationships that come about through those issues. Um, do you think this is important in YA? Is it more important than than adult? I think it is important. I think it's important to to show readers that, you know, what, whatever their experience is, whoever they love whatever however they live, it's all it's all valid and everybody has a story. I think when I grew up 
the books that the children's books we had in the in the kind of 70s and 80s were you know a lot of Enid Blyton a lot of boarding school everybody was white um everybody was straight and it's I I love it that literature doesn't you know, very actively doesn't do that anymore uh, I think with Libby just part part of the character for me was that she has this big crush on on um, somebody at college and it's a girl and that was just part of her character it wasn't even mm. I didn't think I'm going to write an issue but you know better maybe maybe no. if she's yeah. maybe if she's gay that would be that would be better it just felt like that was who she was and so so the the girl she has a big a big crush on Zoe is is a girl and the the step family thing I just really I, I think it's really interesting the different family setups and the I've got a lot of well I've got, I haven't got a lot I've got three half siblings one from my, my mum's side two on my dad's side and the relationships I'm the oldest out of everybody the relationships you can have in in the kind of more complex and interesting um family setups are really really lovely I I love my my um, brothers and sister and the the youngest two the two in um in things to do before the end of the world Libby's younger much younger half brother and sister who who are in it at the beginning and I wanted the very little children to be in it because you know it's it's something going on around them that they have no idea or understanding mm. about um, but the relationship she has with them where she goes over to babysit for them and at the moment the parents walk out of the door she lets them have chocolate and watch telly and do all the things that she's just been told not to do is it, uh, it, it really comes from my experience at her age of having having a um, much younger half brother and sister and just loving that relationship with them it's something really magical it's like not pair you're not a parent you're not mm -hmm. a sibling of their generation you're you're you could be just somebody a little bit different so I I really liked writing about that as well. So, so a child mm -hmm. a child said to me a little while back um I said we were doing science experiments and I said we're gonna have to wait until we get an adult and this <laughs> child said to me but you're an adult and I said no I'm not really I'm, <laughs> yeah. not, I'm not really a grown-up and she said to me are you a teenager? <laughs> I said yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I love the idea that, that the little ones kind of look up to the older children. You know, they yeah. Teenagers, don't they? <laughs> they and do. Of course, Lovely. Of course, having the little ones in the story, it gives a, another dimension of what future are they going to have? Exactly. The older ones who know nothing about what's happening now, and yet what will ultimately be the their time when they grow up is what mm. we are creating now so that yeah. was yet another dimension that came in there yeah thank you yes it was I, I felt, felt like it was it needed that needed just that the the total innocence of of the very little children as well um because yeah they're growing up in or or you know depending mm. how you interpret the ending of the book they're they're in a world that where they've made no decisions and it's all happening around them and I love that Libby's got such a a relationship with the relationship that she has with the father because um Libby is shy and finds it difficult to talk and we find that her dad that she gets it from the dad uh, but I love I love the fact that she's got both part both parents sorry in her life and she's got a relationship with both new partners in her life so I think I think that's lovely that you've got that close-knit family around her and you're dealing with a subject which is the end of the world. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, I thought that was lovely that she, she's got everybody around her. I won't say anything else. Um, <laughs> <laughs> now, you said on Twitter, I've just had one of those rare, lovely writing sessions where the book did its own thing and I was just along for the ride. Oh, yeah. And I thought that was such a wonderful <laughs> thing to say. I've heard that echoed by other writers. Is it something that can be learned or is it a gift that um, that you instinctively have? Because I know that you do teach writing courses and I want to go on to talk a little bit about the writing process and, and that side of it. So where does that come from, this lovely idea that the character is on the show and telling the story? Oh, it's lovely when that happens. Yes, I think I think it is a part of the process that there are some days you're – it's really hard and you just have to make yourself keep going and I I block out the world I switch off the internet and shut myself away and do all I have all kinds of techniques for that and generally if I'm writing a first draft I'll just look at the word count and I'll tell myself how many words I have to write and then you do it so some of the time you're just pushing through and then other times it, it's like that it's like you're just you're just the kind of 
conduit for the book to somehow write itself and that is the absolute joy I love it I love it when that happens and I think I think every book is a mixture of those moments of the um I suppose the inspiration and the perspiration the the Mm -hmm. the bit where you have to make yourself do it one thing I find is that a lot of people I a lot of writers I work with teaching find that you can write the beginning of a book and it's all exciting you have your idea you sit down you write it um it's great and then you get to a certain point in where if you're if it's a full length novel which would be about 90 to 100,000 words then when you get to about 30,000 words it just peters out and it's you're so far from the beginning that you've lost that kind of momentum but you realize you're absolutely nowhere near the end and that's that kind of yeah 30,000 ish word slump happens to everybody it happens to me every single book and that bit you very much just have to write your way through it there's no it's like um going on a bear hunt we can't go over it we can't go under it oh no we've got to go through it and I you just you've just got to go through it and there's no other way around it so I in my experience of working with with writers and aspiring writers it's very easy to get disheartened at that point because it at the, if you're excited about the idea of your book, then you can get really swept along by the book, kind of the story unfolding. The characters are just sort of doing their own thing and they don't always do what you want them to do. And that's really funny when they don't because you realise that you've kind of made a character who doesn't fit into your plot. So you have to let them do their own plot. And that's that's all just wonderful. So much fun. And then it will grind to a halt and you'll think, well, now what? I, I'm not... I, I'm nowhere near the end of the book. I can't do it. Um, ab- abandon it. Go and do something more fun. And it, yeah, so I think the the key to getting a book actually finished is to write through those bits. And then the the fun times will come back again. And when you can suddenly see the end in sight, it's amazing again. Absolutely brilliant. And for me, the last six weeks or so of writing a book are just the most fun. And I wake up in the morning thinking about it, and I just want to do it because you it's it's almost there and you're just shaping it into being its its actual self which is wonderful then then you have a first draft and it's probably not very good but that's the worst it's ever going to be so everything you do to it from that point on is to make it better so what's not to love about that (laughs) so um what was I going to say then um yeah the 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 idea of um the idea of, of writing the book, um, a lot of authors, sorry, I'm just thinking of trying to keep my, my thoughts there. A lot of mm-hmm. authors um, write really good books. You start reading the book, you're right in there with them. I've done this a few times, especially with something that somebody has said is so wonderful. I start reading it and it's building and building and building. And then there's no middle and it doesn't finish off. It kind of goes nowhere. Oh, but you've got such yeah. fantastic endings to your book. Have you always, have you always, you said you, you think about the end and then you work towards it, but have you always found that the ending's easy? I I do. I think if you, if you do know what your end point is going to be, it, it really, 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 really helps because you just don't want it to, um, to fizzle out like that at all. And I, yeah, and actually looking, look, thinking about my books, I, I mean, things to do before the end of the world is obviously working towards its own built-in ending mm. and um I, I won't say quite how it ends but I wanted to make it a little bit um to leave it a little bit open-ended but to end it not with total horror so that that was it had its own time scale going on there was the clock was ticking all the way through the book and it obviously makes its way through to to that date in September so that that had its its own built-in ending for others um you can it's nice to end with some form of a twist and quite often although I might know what my end point is the the ending itself will change when with ghosted my my next YA book the one that I'm just proofreading now that's it's got an element of of um murder mystery to it and one of the things that happened at the end was the the revelation of of who who did it who done it and and I wrote it I I kind of knew in my head who it was going to be I wrote it and then I looked back and for my next draft it was so obvious because I'd known what I who it was going to be all the way through and I just sort of accidentally 
made it so obvious there were no real red herrings it was just always going to be that person and it was really um un unintriguing if that if that was a word which it isn't um and so next draft i there was another character just sort of lurking lurking around and i changed who who the killer actually was in my second draft of the book without telling my editor before she read it. And it, it suddenly that was the thing that worked because it wasn't what I was expecting when I was writing the basis, the basis of the book. I wasn't expecting it to be that person. So I hope that the reader won't be expecting it to necessarily be that person as well. So it, it does change. And I think as the book evolves, the, the sort of nuances of what's going to happen evolve as well. There's a bit in The Girl Who Came Out of the Woods where I was writing it and she she walked into, the, she knew somebody had come to see her and she walks into the kitchen at her grandparents' house where she's living in, in Clevedon near Bristol and, and the person's there. And as I was writing it, I was thinking it was going to be one person, but as the words came out, it turned out it was somebody different. And I was like, oh, okay, I'll go, I'll go with that then. I just, my fingers wrote something different from what my head was planning, which was really strange, but, um, but it, it did work. So I, I stayed with that. That you, can, that you can see that vision though. Uh, but it, it's kind of double-edged sword because if I knew what the ending was going to be, then I would find it difficult not to give the ending away. Yeah. Me, the beauty of your books is um, I had no idea about the ending. That that okay. never entered my head at all. So <laughs> it was really good starting with it. I got into the middle bit and I was I was kind of thinking, yeah, yes, you know, they're having a nice time, they're doing this, they're doing that, whatever. But then yeah. it takes a whole different direction and I, I read for th I read the last the last of the book I read three hours I was <laughs> sitting here just reading just turning over to see you know what Yay. happened oh and, brilliant and that, is, that is the beauty of a good book that um that you don't see the ending coming or that it comes and after I finished reading the book I got that lovely calm sort of feeling that came over me oh good Libby, Libby had taken her journey these things had happened to her um, but she'd grown through her experiences, mm. and so that's why it makes it such a wonderful coming of age novel. Um, but then there are all the other, like we've said, there are all the other bits in there as well. There's the the end of the world. How would you deal with it? There's climate change. There's 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 the fact that we, if we don't do something about it now, it's not it's it's all right saying well it's got well we'll do something in a bit we'll do something in a bit. But if we don't do something now, there won't be a a time. No. And exactly. It's quite, it's quite possible that that permafrost could melt and we could be, you know, in, in those situations. Um, so for, for aspiring writers, I wondered if you could just give us a quick idea of how you get that book. What's the process of getting that idea in your head um, and then seeing it as a as a finished? I'm waving my hands around, aren't I? Um, <laughs> I always do that. <laughs> and then seeing it as a finished as a finished product. Yeah, it's. Um, I mean, it, it's so exciting every time you every time a box arrives full of books. It's like that's amazing. That was a, that was an idea in my head, and now it's an object I can I can hold in my hand. It never ever um gets old that feeling it's so exciting so I think my advice to aspiring writers if you have an idea in your head just write it just assume you can do it you can do it so so much of it is is just doing it is not being um discouraged when it's difficult it is difficult it's really hard it's really hard to write a hundred thousand words or I think the shortest you could write a full-length novel would be about 65 to 70 um it's it, it's a daunting thing so just don't get daunted do one day at a time the mm. thing that works for me is I have a program on the computer which switches the internet off completely and you just set it for as long as you want it to it's called freedom there's loads of other programs like that I then have a different thing on my phone where it's called forest you plant a tree and the tree grows if you use your phone for anything else then the tree dies so you'll feel very bad and it does they do plant trees in real life as well so it is a kind of charity thing as well so I just switch myself off completely from all distractions shut the door don't let anyone talk to me and just write it just if you write a thousand words a day then in 70 days you've got a draft of a novel it's like you you literally will so just write it don't look back. And if, you know, 70 days time, that's not very long. That's just over two months. You can write a first draft in that mm -hmm. time. Don't worry if it's what you're writing 
seems bad. Sometimes it will feel like the worst thing that has ever been written in the history of the world. That happens to me every book. Just if things things aren't going right, just write them in the direction you want them to go on. Leave yourself notes all over the place. My speciality is leaving myself notes saying things like, make this good. And then when I come to look at it, I thanks, thanks, I'll just do that then. <laughs> um, but leave yourself notes if you want things to change direction, you'll want to drop things in which come to fruition later and things like that. Just do it as a as scaffolding, really, just write it. And then however bad it is, once you've got that that 70,000 words, you've got a draft of your book. And that means that your book exists, you have a manuscript, and all you can do is use it as a platform and make it better. And then suddenly, it becomes more manageable it feels like you can do it you can if there's a bit that you're getting stuck on just skip it jump to the next bit you want to write mm. very often that will I, I'm not sure who's there's a piece famous piece of writing advice and I can't remember who it's from saying like basically don't write the boring bits if you're getting stuck somewhere it might be that it's a boring bit so don't mm. write it just jump to the next bit you want to write and you might come back and fill that in or you might find that you don't need to um there's such a joy to going back and editing and rewriting and seeing what you need to change have a bit once you've got that that basic first draft step away from it for a couple of weeks if you can and then come back and you'll see it with completely new editor's eyes and you'll know what you need to do and then you're you're halfway there you really are more than halfway there just keep keep at it do another draft step away again come back and then you might think actually this isn't this isn't so bad so it, it can be done. And the the main reason people don't write their books is because it is so daunting and it's so easy to get discouraged. But don't give up. That's my my writing advice, really. I think it's when you talk about 75,000 words. When I, think <laughs> about, when I think about what you write for your dissertation. You know, you <laughs> <laughs> but you're making it up, though. So for your dissertation, you have to like reference everything yeah, and awesome. it's all academic. Awesome. This You can literally write anything. So you're just yeah. writing things off the top of your head and then you can go back and research them afterwards and write them properly. I think the, but... bit I take away, the best mm -hmm. bit I take away from that is don't write the boring bits. That's really yeah. clever. Because if you just write down, you know, it, anything anything that I have to do, um, you know, like, like doing these, I write all the bits down and then I fill the bits in between. Mm. I come over come across oh I'll just oh I'll just and I write all that down um computers are great because you can do it on there and then you just fill the bits in you know in between as you go along so I yeah think that, I think that's excellent advice for um, <laughs> for everybody um right I'm just looking at the clock we've we've seen oh my before. gosh We've talked for an hour already and I could just carry on talking to you about the rest of your books because it's just so fabulous that you have all these wonderful ideas and then you can share them. And what a wonderful thing to, to look at when you turn around and look at a bookshelf. Yeah. And all, that, all that is your work and you've done that. You know, it's, <laughs> it really is fantastic. So oh, thank, um, you. thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for all your wonderful books um, that you've written. It's been a pleasure to talk to you this afternoon. It's an honour to talk to you. And I'm looking forward to reading so much more of your work. I, I, can't, I think I might go to Flora Banks next. <laughs> I think I might like that one. Although that might be a good one to read in the hot summer rather than as we're as we're looking out as the pouring <laughs> rain that we're gonna have for the next few weeks. Yeah, um, that's true. <laughs> so if you just like to stay with us, please, I'll just finish um telling people what's going to happen next. Oh lovely. We'll, Thank you, Linda. And then, we'll, and then we'll then we'll be able to have a, a quiet chat afterwards if that's all right with you. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you so much. So our next Cosmia event is tomorrow and that's at five o'clock. It's with Nicola Davis and Jackie Morris. And they'll be talking about their book, the, about the, the book of, that Nicola Davis has written, which is called, there you go, The Song That Sings. Um, it's a stunning environmental epic which covers and chapter, sorry, with covers and chapters illustrated by award-winning illustrator Jackie Morris. That's a mouthful. Um, now, I told you at the beginning of the broadcast about our lovely friends at Reed and that, um, that they were offering 20% discount on all the books that have been featured in the festival to, uh, this week. So there you are. You, that's your, if you go along to Reed's and just explain to them that you were part of, part of, the, um, part of the festival, you will be able to have 20% discount on all of the books. And I can recommend a book called Things to Do Before the End of the World. That's a, a really good one, um, which you can also 
you can also you um access through your libraries of course we've got to keep we didn't, we didn't talk about libraries and things yeah. did we? but we've had a, an interesting conversation anyway so if you want to go along there that's the um that's read at home firth it's 41 huddersfield road home firth and if you want to do the website there you go that's to be read.co.uk and you can also follow them at read underscore home firth and we just like to to mention local local bookshops because um because we do um so i think that's everything that i had to say um the only thing that i now have to say is yet again thank you very much to emily and thank you for watching all the sessions don't forget if you've missed anything do catch up I, i've got watched as many as i can but still a couple that i'm going to watch so go back and look on the cosmia website and watch our other interesting conversations and with that i'll just say thank you very much to emily thank you linda say goodbye thank you oh thank you bye